G'day ladies and gents, Cubic Media here. You're probably looking at this thumbnail like, damn, that explosion looks sick. But surely it's fake, right? Surely you can't make a TNT explosion literally look like a nuclear explosion in Minecraft, right? If the explosion is fake, then what on earth made this gigantic crater? Well, to figure it out, let's find ourselves an unsuspecting village and deliver it a present. An explosive present. And after charging the momentum for a while, our payload will emerge from the silo. Above the silo, our payload will find itself a block of powdered snow, which facilitates the momentum cancellation on the target. Then, the flying machine returns to the silo, and our payload is nowhere to be seen. It has arrived at the target. Before we go over, let's go ahead and tick freeze so you can get a better look at it. And our payload should be somewhere above here. Let's go ahead and drop down the tick rate. And then unfreeze. Oh, hello. That is a literal TNT nuke. And just wait until it explodes. Oh. Okay, what have I done here? Oh my god. Looking back at the replay, in one moment, there is a happy and thriving village. The next, utter devastation. <laughs> and just to add insult to inventory, their bodies get flung into freaking orbit. That's amazing. <laughs> what have I done? But more importantly, how have I done it? Let me introduce to you the new and improved Orbital Strike Cannon 2.0. Now this is some insane redstone tech. If you haven't seen my previous videos about the Orbital Strike Cannon, I would highly recommend you watch them to get the context for this beast. The cannon has been upgraded substantially, with a customizable payload encoder, decimal encoded fire control, and a compact profile that can be easily hidden underground. But what you're probably wondering is how we were able to make that amazing nuclear explosion. Well, the shape of the explosion at the target destination all begins with the payload encoder. This is like an advanced integrated circuit with various settings such as counters, timers, more counters, as well as what I like to call a redstone breadboard. For example, this first slice has this counter set to 24, meaning that when we activate this slice, it will send 24 pulses down into the TNT duping rails. These rails will send a trigger over to this TNT duper. If we go ahead and disable TNT explosion damage, we can go ahead and trigger the duper and you can see it will duplicate the TNT by actuating it vertically. This enables us to do something extremely powerful with the TNT in our payload. Because the TNT is generated inside of lazy chunks, it will be frozen in suspended animation. And every time a TNT entity is created, it will get some random momentum in a specific direction. Here's a quick demonstration of why preserving the random momentum of the TNT in our payload is so powerful. If I go ahead and disable entity ticking, and then create hundreds of TNT entities in the same spot with their random momentum preserved in suspended animation, the instant we start entity ticking again, you can see the TNT spreads out in a perfect circle. The reason we observe this pattern is that the random momentum given to TNT always has the same magnitude in the velocity, but the direction is picked at random. So using the duper, we obtain a whole bunch of suspended TNT entities with random momentum, and once these TNT fly to the target destination, 
and are loaded in, they will spread out in a perfect circle. But what's even more insane is that after we've duped an entire batch of TNT, we also retain the option to completely nullify the random momentum. So we can also make TNT that will simply just fall straight down. We can even select the momentum axes independently and only cancel the momentum on one axis. Meaning we have the option to create all kinds of patterns with our payload. All of the magic to control the shape of the payload is done right here. We start with the option to simply trigger the duper, which will dupe 8 TNT all at once. However, if we want a more precise count, we can switch on the single dupe option, which will force it to only duplicate a single TNT. So if we go ahead and activate both of these rails together, you'll see we only dupe a single TNT instead of the whole 8. Once we've finished preparing a batch of TNT, we will then activate the alignment. We also have the added option to cancel the X momentum or the Z momentum. If we take a look at the settings for this first slice, we'll see we have it configured to dupe all 8 TNT at once and from this counter do that 24 times, meaning we get 192 TNT in total. When we trigger the alignment, we do not cancel the X and we do not cancel the Z, meaning this first slice will produce TNT that will form that perfect ring. So now through the control of the random momentum, we can control the shape of our payload. But if we're going to make something as sophisticated as a nuclear explosion, we're going to need an additional control. This is why we also control the fuse time of the TNT using tick precise timers. The basic idea is that a hopper minecart can pull an item every game tick. So each one of these items will represent a single game tick of fuse time on our TNT. If we want our fuse time to be shorter, we want to put more items in this hopper minecart. So to demonstrate, let's spawn some TNT here. And then once the timer triggers, the TNT moves over into the lazy chunks where it's now in suspended animation and therefore won't explode. If we get the fuse time of our TNT entity, you can see it is currently exactly one game tick. If we reduce the count by a single item like so, and then run it again, it now activates one game tick sooner and if we look at the fuse time of our TNT, it now has exactly two game ticks of fuse. The only caveat is that this option is not available to TNT that has random momentum because in order to burn down the fuse time, the TNT has to be in entity processing chunks, which means if it has random momentum, it will quickly lose that momentum as its motion is processed. This means for any batch that has random momentum in it, we are forced to use the full fuse time of the TNT of 80 game ticks, which corresponds to the minimum count in these timers. Alright, we can control the amount of TNT, the shape of the TNT, the fuse time of the TNT. But there is one last mechanism that we need to truly elevate the capabilities of this cannon, and that involves the payload scheduling which is controlled by this device right here. However, this is where things get rather complicated. What we are essentially doing is saying once we have created a batch of TNT with a specific count, shape, and fuse time, we go down to this circuit and ask what is the next payload we want to create? Currently, this cannon is set to create that gigantic nuclear explosion. So if we follow the programming, we have the 24 batches of TNT, which retain their random momentum, and therefore have the full fuse time of 80 game ticks. When this batch is created, we will power these droppers, making this item flick across. When this counter is triggered, we then send a signal down to the breadboard which has been configured to transmit the signal 
to the next slice, which will then retrieve the programming for the next payload. The second payload will dupe a single count of only a single TNT. This single TNT will also have its momentum completely cancelled and the minimum fuse time of only a single tick. We now arrive at the scheduling counter for the second slice, which apart from the first slice has 10 items in it, meaning if there are still items in this dropper when it gets activated, the signal will instead be bypassed into this second breadboard which has been configured to loop the signal back to the first slice. And so what this essentially means is that we trigger this 24 times, then trigger this once, then loop back to this 24 once, and that whole process will be repeated 10 times. Once the scheduling counter reaches zero, the signal is instead sent to this breadboard, which is configured to transmit to the next slice. So instead of making the full nuclear explosion, let's go ahead and disconnect this, connect the third slice, and then disconnect this. So now we are only going to create the first two payloads. With the cannon now running, and my player in spectator mode with spectators generate chunks false, we can now see the cannon in action. We speed up the tick rate a bit. You'll see the encoder flipping back and forth between the first and the second slice. Payload has just finished charging and has been delivered up to that powdered snow. Once that flying machine reaches the bottom, we'll activate this chunk loader which will load the payload and send it on its way. If we just watch the target destination in the sky, you see that? Our payload has exploded immediately as it flew above the target, even though it is in unloaded chunks. With the game frozen, I'm going to tick forward a single step with my player right above the payload. Oh, there it is. Would you look at that? Our payload looks like it's forming some sort of geometry. If we continue stepping... Oh, hello. Hmm, that looks familiar. It turns out that what we have done is first created a batch of 192 TNT and then we have created a single TNT that will explode immediately after it has finished moving towards the target destination. So what has happened is first 192 TNT with random momentum making it form a circle will arrive at the destination. Then immediately after it a single TNT will fly above it and explode, giving momentum to the TNT that is already at the target. This means that over repeated batches that get accelerated at the target destination, we essentially stagger the batches into this cone shape. But then why the hell have we got this ring forming at the top? Well it turns out that Mojang has actually implemented a speed limit on entities when they are first loaded in a chunk. This means if the payload is in an unloaded chunk and then all of a sudden the chunk is loaded, any momentum which is greater than 10 blocks per tick will be set to zero. And you can clearly see from the shape of this cone that the downwards momentum builds up faster than the horizontal momentum, meaning the downwards momentum eventually exceeds 10 blocks per tick However, the horizontal momentum is still within that limit. So assuming that there wasn't a speed limit on the TNT when the chunk is loaded, the TNT would continue all the way down in this cone shape. However, once the TNT exceeds the downwards velocity of 10 blocks per tick, the downwards velocity is set to zero, and then it forms a flat ring. 
And amazingly, this quirk in the way that entities are handled in Minecraft just happens to create the perfect conditions to produce a perfect mushroom cloud out of TNT. So a special thanks to the developer who decided to put speed limits on entities when chunks are loaded. So we now have the capability of making perfect mushroom clouds out of explosions using TNT. However, these explosions are not all that destructive. That is what the next three slices of the payload encoder are designed for. It's really funny to think that this fancy ass show of a mushroom shaped TNT is mostly superficial. In fact, literally all of the damage is contained inside of this neat little unit right here. We grab ourselves a good view. There we go. That was the charge that does all the damage. And this is not even big by the cannon standards. If we go in and fiddle with the cannon settings a bit, you can obtain a much, much bigger explosion. But bear in mind, there is a performance limit to how much TNT you can stuff into a single payload. So if all you need is the devastating effect of the explosion, I would suggest simply foregoing the first two slices and wiring it directly to the payload that actually does the damage. So that was just about all the details you need for the payload encoder. But what about actually firing and aiming the cannon? Well, for the previous Orbital Strike Cannon, we had these enormous duping arrays that would allow for omnidirectional fire control. But this required quite complicated and buggy mechanics for an Excel spreadsheet to convert coordinates to valid settings for the cannon. So for the new Orbital Strike Cannon, we will focus on simply firing towards a single quadrant. So this means that depending on where your cannon is in your world and its orientation, you only be able to fire in a certain direction. But from the way that I've seen people using the Orbital Strike Cannon, I can't imagine this being much of an issue, given that people tend to build it very far away from the target anyway. This means the cannon should offer a perfectly fine field of fire, provided you build it off in the corner of your world somewhere. Let's say we want to strike a target like this medieval village. We want to go ahead and grab the coordinates of roughly the center, as well as the coordinates for the origin of the cannon. Then the conversion from coordinates to fire setting uses a very simple equation that we can run in Excel. So let's input 4843 and 4568. And these are the settings we need to put into the decimal encoders. To start with, we want to make sure we get our bearings with the cannon. So if we look at this encoder right here, it controls the count for the TNT on the Z axis. And this encoder right here controls the count for the TNT on the X axis. For the X axis, we had a number of 416. So all we need to do is punch in 400 plus 10 plus 6. And that will give us 416. On the z-axis, we have 281. With decimal values, it's literally that easy. To prime the cannon, we then hit this note block. And just like with the previous Orbital Strike cannon, it will wait for the player to leave the area so that the system can start chunk loading on its own. We can simulate that by going to spectator mode with spectator loads chunks false. And as you can see, the machine starts immediately. We go ahead and tick warp. We're already charging the payload. And that is the cannon firing. 
If we fly over to the village now and load the chunks that the payload is in. There it is. Oh, doesn't look like it was very effective. But fortunately, with this new encoder design, the cannon now holds on to the previous fire settings. So you can trigger it immediately and not have to change anything and it will fire again with the exact same settings at the exact same position. And there is the second payload fired on exactly the same position. There we have it, the new and improved orbital strike cannon with nuclear strike capabilities. But also consider that using the payload encoder you can make all sorts of different kinds of payloads. For example, if you just have a whole bunch of TNT and a whole bunch more TNT, then offset the second batch of TNT by a single tick, you would recreate the same stab charge that the previous orbital strike cannon could make. Or if you mix up a stab charge with a limited amount of TNT, with a ring charge as well as a propellant charge, you can make a stab charge which penetrates a certain depth and then starts to spread out. The possibilities are endless. But if you want to try experimenting with this machine yourself, be sure to grab a copy of the world download down in the description. And if you find any really cool payload settings, be sure to join the Wavetech Discord where you can post them and share them with our community. Oh, and I just realized, pretty much the instant that this video goes live, I'm going to be hitting 100,000 subscribers. Unfortunately, I've been absolutely flat out with university as it is my last semester before I graduate. In fact, I barely even had time to make this video. So if you feel like motivating me a little, feel free to subscribe and I'm sure we'll be able to figure out some way to celebrate when we reach the 100k benchmark. Thank you all very much for watching and try not to destroy Minecraft with my new cannon.